In this screencast, we will wrap up single source shortest paths algorithms with Dijkstra's algorithm, perhaps one of the most famous algorithms in computer science. And we're still on Lisiansky here on the beach with a pair of masked boobies. And we'll be having a look at a few more of Lisiansky's famous coral gardens. So here's Mr. Dijkstra himself. This is a shortest paths algorithm. You might recall that breadth first search was also a shortest paths algorithm. And Dijkstra's has some similarities to breadth first search. It's essentially a weighted version of it. Whereas breadth first search used a FIFO queue, first in, first out, and it determined the distance by the number of edges. So we don't have any weights on the edges. It's just unit cost per edge. And it would find everything one unit away and then everything two units away and so on by putting things in this FIFO queue. Dijkstra's algorithm is accomplishing a similar thing using a priority queue where you, you have to account for the weight of the edges, so that's why you need a priority queue rather than just first in, first out. Dijkstra's is also very similar to Prim's algorithm. It's greedy and has a similar iteration. So let's bring Prim's in here. So both of these use a min priority queue where the items on the priority queue are um, V minus S, the things that haven't been incorporated in the set that we're growing yet. With prims, we're growing a set of vertices that are now incorporated in the tree of the minimum spanning tree. And with Dijkstra, S is the set of vertices whose final shortest path lengths are determined. In both cases, the weight on the priority item in the priority queue is going to be an estimate of the cost of including it in our growing set. And we're going to take a greedy approach of including the next cheapest thing with extract min in both cases. The main difference is what that weight is. With Prim's algorithm, we're just concerned with minimizing the cost to take that one edge that it takes to get from U, one of the vertices we've already visited, to V, one of the new vertices outside of our set. Remember, there was an implicit set A here. And so we just, we're just concerned with it, that cost of one step to get there to make it from an outsider to an insider. Whereas with Dijkstra's algorithm, we're concerned with this, the cost of, of the whole path. So we have this relax procedure here that's keeping track of the cost of the whole path from the start vertex S to V. Otherwise, very similar. Initialize single source up here does the same kind of stuff that we do down here with prims. Uh, you know, we set everybody's distance to in infinity and their parents to nil and then we're going to set s to zero and that's the same as this decrease key here setting the root of the tree to zero and then both of them say while the queue is not empty extract min and uh, in this case we know that this is now going to be added to the set so we just add it and for each vertex v that's adjacent they both do that we're going to do something with those vertices essentially we're going to say if we've got a cheaper way to include them in the set here which is what prims does then let's change what the parent is and decrease the key. Now, if we had the relax procedure up here, you may recall it does the same thing, essentially. It says, if this is a cheaper way, then change its weight in the queue and update the parent. It does the same thing. Again, the only difference is whether we're just recording the cost of one step or whether we're recording the cost of the whole path. And a final thing to note is that Dijkstra's algorithm assumes that there's no negative weight edges. So to recap, Dijkstra, like Bell and Ford, initializes a single source where everybody's distance is set to infinite, except for S is set to zero. And then big S is the set of things we've already discovered is set to null. Q is set to everybody else. Then we keep extracting the min. And here the min is the vertex with the, shortest, the next shortest path cost to the vertex. And we know at this point when we extract it that it will be the correct value. Um, so we can include it in the set of things for which we have discovered the shortest paths. And then we update all its adjacent vertices with the relax procedure. And this will cause the, of course, the queue to be reorganized um, when their keys are updated. And so next time around the loop, the next extract min will find the next closest vertex and so on. So let's look at an example. Here's an example graph. And we're going to call initialize single source which as usual will give everybody an infinite cost except for the start vertex and it will set everybody's parent or predecessor to uh, nil. And now we've initialized the initial set 
to the empty set and now we're going to put on the queue all the vertices of the graph and of course this is a min queue so s will be on there first because it has a min value and the other ones we'll just write down in their alphabetical order because they all have the same value okay so implicit in this simple assignment statement really is all those operations of building the queue but in this case if we have direct access to the representation we don't have to pay those you know those log costs of uh, uh, doing the the insert and update because we know that they all have this the infinite and the first one is zero we could just initialize the array putting the start vertex first and then listing all the other ones in the array now while the queue is not empty we're going to extract them in that will give us vertex u is s and we're going to add that uh, vertex we just extracted to the s set so we're going to put it here and then for each vertex in the uh, list of adjacent vertices and we've got two of them here x and y we're going to do the relaxation procedure so the relaxation is can we get there cheaper and so let's do that for x first yes of course we can we can get there at a cost of 10 and now we have a predecessor pointer and uh, we would also update x's position in the queue right now it's correct because these two have cost infinite and then we go to the next adjacent vertex which would be y and we can say oh we can get there cheaper too and so we're going to say that's five and here's a predecessor but this causes the priority queue to reshuffle because now y has a lower key than x so it's going to look like this and then we exit that for loop and we do our next iteration of the while loop and extract the next thing from the queue which is now y so we now have y is added to the set s and we look at all of y's neighbors from y can we get the x for cheaper we got five plus four that's nine so yes and so x's parent is now or predecessor parent is more appropriate terminology for trees uh, though this is a tree so i guess either works <laughs> um, anyway we update x to 9 so x is still in the correct place in the priority queue because this one's infinite and then we look at uh, y also has a neighbor z and so can we get there at cheaper cost well so far we've got 5 plus 1 is 6 so we update z to 6 and this causes reorganization of the priority queue because z now has a lower cost than x so we got uh, z it costs six and x it costs nine. Oh yes and z's parent is also y okay now we will run through the while loop again do another extract min we're working on z which we've just added to s we look at its adjacent vertices from z we can only get to x six plus two is eight we actually update x and give it a, a new parent notice that that changes this parent link and uh, by the way you, hopefully you noticed that I should have erased this one earlier too when I did that update originally it got a cost 10 from here then it got a cost 9 from here and now it's getting a cost 8 from Z and notice also the costs are the sum of the uh, you know 5 6 7 8 the sum of the weights on the whole path not just the one step like in Prim's algorithm okay so that um, is the only neighbor of Z and so we exit that while loop and the next time through we now take out x and um, technically it would check all the vertices adjacent to x to see if it can update any of their costs it can't but that's the basic idea we now are done um, we have a shortest paths tree which happens to be a linear structure but with all the shortest paths and the appropriate weights on the nodes so why don't negative weights work with Dijkstra's algorithm? Let's take a look at a quick example here. We're going to initialize Q, and we're going to initialize everybody's cost to be infinite, other than S, which is 0. And then we're going to do the usual thing, uh, extract min, of course S, gets extracted, gets added to the uh, Q here. We're going to update uh, X and Z. So X's cost is now updated to 2 and it's in the correct place on the queue here and we have a parent pointer of course and uh, z is going to also be updated to two with a parent pointer and it's in the correct place on the oh no it's not uh let's see so we got to swap y and z here okay and then we iterate extract min x uh, x can reach y at a cost of seven 
it's a 7. Uh, Z is still next because it's a 2. And oh yes, let's put in that parent pointer. And I forgot to put the X there. Okay. All right, next pass. Z comes off because it's got the, the uh, lowest cost here. Let's put Z here. No neighbors to consider, so we're done. And then Y comes off and gets put on here. And uh, nothing else to consider, so we're done. So what's wrong? Well, the shortest path would have been 2, 5, negative 10, which would have been a cost of negative 3 to get the Z. But we didn't do it because when we took Z off the min Q and we put it on S, the, the big S, this S here, at that point we assume we have the best cost to an item. And it doesn't work because longer paths made that subsequently hit negative edges may reduce the cost of something. And so you may have already taken it off, like breadth first search, you know, the shorter number of links, you've already taken it off and said you think you got the best estimate here but you didn't realize there was something else that was going to make it cheaper. So we're going to run into this on the next topic on all pair shortest paths. Uh, this issue of the negative weights will come up again. But before we go on to the correctness and complexity of Dijkstra's algorithm, take a quick look at some corals again. These are Imantiporas, rice corals, possibly mixed in with Pocilloporas, uh, lace corals. I'm not really sure. Some nice pores on these things. And as usual, there's a guard in the garden. For proof of correctness, let's note that what Dijkstra's algorithm is trying to do is to build a setup S of vertices for which we know the shortest path. So we just have to show that once something is added to S, it's got the correct shortest path value. Delta of SV will be its assigned distance when it's added to S. And the upper bound property, which says that once you achieve this equality, um, it will stay the same thereafter. We'll then keep them there until we exit the algorithm with all the vertices in S. So initialization, it's pretty trivial. The set is empty, so it's trivially true. And so the main part is the maintenance part. Uh, so we just need to show that the estimate is the shortest path weight when U is added to the set in each um, iteration. We're going to do this by proof of, uh, by contradiction. We're going to say, suppose there is, there is a vertex U such that when it's added, it doesn't have the shortest path weight. It has something larger. And so we're, our proof, let's choose U to be the first such vertex added to S because there is some such vertex that it happens to if it happens at all. And the proof by contradiction proceeds as follows. Again, we've got U has been chosen to be the first vertex added to S such that it, its uh, estimate was not the optimal at the time it was added to S. So what would we know about such a U? Well, we know it's not S because S is already assigned to its optimal value. And uh, we also know that S is in the set big S. So the big set big S is not empty. So that means there must be a path from S, which is in big S, to U. And so if there is a path, there's a shortest path, and we're going to call it P from S to U. So let's decompose this path P. It starts in S from the vertex little s and it goes out to U which is not in big S and somewhere along the way it must cross from being in to being out. So let's pick X and Y to be the edge along which that crossing happens or the uh, vertices the edge between them being the, where that crossing happens. And let's reason about uh, X and Y here. Now we can argue that the value assigned to y at this point has to be the optimal value of the uh, shortest path from s to y. And the reason being, since we chose u to be the first vertex added to s when it doesn't have the uh, shortest path value assigned, then x must have had the shortest path value assigned when x was brought into s. And then by the convergence property, whenever a vertex is added, to S, all of its edges are relaxed. In particular, this edge, the Y was relaxed. And by the convergence property, then we know that Y would have also gotten the uh, optimal or shortest path value assigned as its distance estimate. So at this point, we have YD is delta SY. Now we can show that the Y's distance estimate has to be the same or bounded above by uh, U's distance estimate as follows. U dot D 
is an upper bound on the actual cost from S to U, which we may not know yet. And because S occurs earlier on the path, the actual cost from S to Y has to be bounded above by that. And we already have that Y dot D is equal to that. So therefore putting all of this together, we get U dot D is an upper bound on Y dot D. But by hypothesis, U was the first one chosen from the Q. That means U dot D's current value, U's current value D must be less than or equal to Y's current value. Otherwise, U would not have been chosen first from the Q. So putting these two together, that must be that they have the same distance estimate at this point. But that squeezes between them the distance, the actual cost of the distance from S to Y, the actual cost of the distance from S to U is now squeezed between these two that are equal, which forces it in particular for U dot D to be equal to um, delta S U. And that contradicts our assumption that we chose U based on our assumption that U dot D was, did not have delta S U assigned to it. So there's a contradiction, so this must not be true. There must not be a U such that there does not exist a U such that uh, U dot D when it goes into S is not its uh, optimal cost. Then at the end, when Q is empty, of course, we have then um, applied this to all the V's in there. So V dot D is delta S V for all V's in, in the set of vertices, proving correctness. And finally, what about runtime? Well, it depends on the implementation of the priority queue used. Probably the best one in terms of ease of implementation versus speed trade-off would be the binary min heaps that we're familiar with. Now, I've already noted that here in line three, we could potentially pay an expensive cost of, uh, for every, each V vertex, we're going to have to do log V for the uh, insertion into the binary min heap. But I've already noted that we could avoid that by, if we can access the array implementation directly just by putting things in the order we know they're going to be in because the start vertex S will be first followed by everybody else with an infinite cost. But it turns out that this will wash out anyway in the rest of the analysis. So let's look at the rest of it. Uh, we have binary min heap operations which are order of log V because these have uh, up to uh, V vertices in there. And the same for relaxation when you change the um, a key on something in, in the heap, it has to reheap. Uh, so that's or also order log V for that. Well, what are they inside? Well, this Q here has V vertices on it. So if we just take this part of the code here, uh, not worry about that part there, that's constant. We've got a loop of um, order of V loop to take all the V vertices out of the Q times log V. So for this, we get order of V log V course which is the same of what I had up here and then finally what about this well this is inside that while loop but rather than try to count each iteration of the while loop and we don't know how many edges are on the adjacency list uh, once again we switch to aggregate analysis where we say well in aggregate across all the the loops through that while loop we know that we can't have any more than order of e edges on the adjacency list so it's going to be order of e times that we do this order of log v so we get order E log V, and so that overall gives us order of V log V plus order of E log V, or order of V plus E log V, which is what is written down here. Now in a connected graph, there's at least as many edges as vertices, so you can replace that E, that V with an E, so that's order of E plus E log V, which simplifies to order of E log V and we can compare that to Bellman Ford's e log EV, which is slower on a connected graph. Finally, there's these things called Fibonacci heaps that we aren't studying in this course, but they were developed specifically to speed up this algorithm. And they enable a faster rate of order of V log V plus E. Well, that's the end of our day at Lisiansky and the end of our examination of single source shortest paths with Dijkstra's algorithm.